everyone. Thanks for joining DevSecOps, the good, the bad, the ugly. Ugly. <laughs> I'm super, uh, super excited to have Tanya. Um, so Tanya, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tanya Jenka, also known as She Hacks Purple, and I am a giant nerd obsessed with the security of software. That's awesome. Um, so Tanya, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're being able to, to come on here and, and share. I know you've been an advocate in DevSecOps, cloud security for quite a while. For those who don't know you, can you maybe go into a little bit of your background? What makes you really the, one of the, the top experts in the field, in my opinion? Oh, thank you, Zach. Um, so I, I was a software developer for around 17 years, and then I met a hacker who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who lured me into information security. And right. then I started as a pen tester, but then I, I found out my, my true uh, calling was application security. So that kind of that bridge in between the security team and the software developers, and sometimes the operations folks or the DevOps folks, and just making sure all the things they do are actually secure. And then at some point I started doing talks, mostly because my professional mentor made me. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, my OWASP, comfort zone. yeah, in my OWASP chapter, um, I was an OWASP chapter leader and we'd never had a woman speaker and every woman right. I asked said no. And I didn't want to be like, I would ask every woman I met and I didn't want to ask them 20 times and be annoying. So my right. mentor was like, maybe you have to do it. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll try it. Ah, scary. Yeah, um, yeah and, and then eventually I joined Microsoft for uh, around two years, and that was really exciting. And I learned all about Azure and cloud security and more modern ways to do application security because previously I'd been working uh, for the government and then doing right. private contracts. And I am not saying that they are, like, doing things um, – in a very, very old way, but they're not bleeding edge because, right. yeah. because, because governments aren't. They need to be safe. Right. They need to be um, a bit more conservative, but Microsoft literally is like inventing the new stuff, right? So, yeah. so that was really cool. And then now I run my own company where I teach people about application security, DevSecOps and cloud security. Yeah, That's it's great. Amazing. Yeah, so, so uh, when we chatted before, you're actually doing some online education, which is great with everything that's going on with, with COVID where most people are working from home. Maybe you could share a little bit about what you're doing there as well. That'd be great. Okay, so um, so I launched my new site called shehackspurple.dev. And originally I was planning to just travel around and teach people, but at Microsoft, they taught me that you have to scale. <laughs> right, <laughs> that multiply is one, yourself. Exactly, that is one lesson that they constantly kept teaching all of us. And so, um, I create lots of content online, but I thought about it and I'm like, what if I could make little mini lessons and then formal courses and then I don't have to give it over and over again. I just, I build it and then, you know, I do like a lot of quality assurance where I have one person do it, then I change it. One person do it and I change it. I'm kind of obsessive about improving, but um, yeah, so basically right now I'm offering online content for $7 a month, which is pretty cheap. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So this month I released a bunch of ask me anything. So for instance, like, how do you start in DevSecOps if you're learning? How do you start if you're a company and so your developers are doing yeah. DevOps and how do you get into it? So with videos and, and articles and checklists, um, I also released a, a deep dive into service I request forgery. It's, um, I don't know if you've heard of the OS top 10, but it is, oh, yeah. A, yep. yeah, so it's like a list of the top 10 vulnerabilities but server-side request forgery is becoming, uh, so I don't want to use the word popular, but let's say mm -hmm. prevalent, um, right. that they were considering doing an emergency release at one point of the top 10 to bring you know, knowledge and attention to this topic. So I thought I would do my part and just make this free download of, so here's five defenses and then here's seven mitigations. So if it's you know, let's make sure it never happens, but then if it does happen, let's make sure the damage right. that happens is very, very small. Right. Um, and so a lot of people were like, oh, I didn't really think about like, you know, making it not happen versus the idea of like doing several different layers of if someone does get in, making sure they cannot get anywhere and you frustrate the crap out of that attacker. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be fun as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know you're, and then you're also, before I jump into a couple questions on the technical side, I, I know that you, you also are doing some sort of like actual classes where, yes. where people can sign up, right? If, if, if they're not able to do training 
um, you know, at their organization, you have some online classes. Can you just briefly touch on that real quick? Because I thought yes. it, was, it would be helpful for a lot of people. Thank you, Zach. So I'm working yeah. on some courses that aren't quite ready yet, but I hope to have them ready very soon. And the idea is, is I want to teach people how to do a job that they want to have. So I've done a lot of AppSec and DevSecOps and cloud security. So that's what I'm starting with. So the first one will be introduction to AppSec. So what the heck is it? How do I go do some? What are the activities? What does a formal yeah. program look like? You know, where do I start versus how high can I get? And then DevSecOps. So our dev team and our ops team have joined right. forces. DevOps is happening. How do I get on board with this? And then I want to go into hands-on. So the first hands-on course I'm going to start with is GitHub Actions yep. because I am a giant nerd. I love GitHub. Um, right. <laughs> and so I want people to be able to hands-on use lots of different tools. So I'm currently in negotiations with lots of really awesome companies about, you know, could we have a license that lasts four hours or could we create a virtual environment where people could go and try it? Because you can call basically anything you want from GitHub Actions and make it run as long as you have a license. Um, and I want people to see, so for instance, um, I'm a big fan of SCA, software composition analysis. I think that it's yep. a huge, easy, fast win, meaning yep. it's ideal for putting in a pipeline. And so yep. if I could get you know, a bunch of different really cool tools that work really well and then yep. create little lessons on all of them, people can understand why you need to know that your third party components are not secure or are secure and then how to find out which ones are a problem and then how to update them so yep. i have like a little dummy app and i'm going to use a bunch of open source projects and it's like okay so how would you fix this because i think security people need to understand that too right yeah I think ab they, absolutely yeah so no, that's um, that's great so a, a little plug out there for all the vendors that may be watching right yes um, tanya's looking for for opportunities where you can be involved in the community where we're all trying to look to ways to give back and i know she's doing some great things on training so um it's one area that i'm pushing internally uh, to figure out where we can support but so to jump into some um some questions here right to leave some information on what you'll go through in your training we often talk about the pipeline within DevSecOps, right and how do you integrate this the, the controls Maybe let's let's do it backwards or or maybe a different approach with, with you, Tanya. Um, what could people be focusing on that's not necessarily inside the pipeline that um, around DevSecOps? Yeah, yeah, Zach, we talked about this and people's obsession and thinking that things only go in the pipeline is not the entirety of DevOps because right. DevOps has three ways, right? And one is that we want really fast feedback, and the other one is that we want lots of efficiency. We want the whole system to go quickly, and then the third one is learning, which is what everyone's doing right now by right. listening to this, right? Right. Um, so, so one example could be so, for instance, let's say you're doing software composition analysis in your pipeline that's really cool mm -hmm. not everything goes through a pipeline all the time not everything's being actively worked on so instead a thing that you could do which would probably be a first move rather than putting in the pipeline is getting read access to all your code repositories and okay. then pointing the sca tool at that right? right and getting a weekly report of all of your different projects and all your different codes so even your legacy stuff that you haven't looked at in a long time Right. Getting a weekly report on that because right. maybe you only release once a year on stuff that's really old. You know, if there's, I don't know, like a bug or, or something's broken, right? But in that time, since you last released it, especially if it didn't go through a pipeline, that means no one has looked at all of your components, but your yep. components have aged. They're still on the internet and you better believe that malicious actors are still looking at them. Right. And by, by this point, there could be a Metasploit module. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And if there's a Metasploit module, by that I mean someone that has no advanced skills whatsoever and has no idea what they're doing would be able to attack you. Right. right. So by scanning your code repository, that's one way that you could not interrupt or slow down your pipeline but still get really good results and get yeah. fast feedback right yeah um so another thing so there's like a new and to touch on that tony i just yeah. wanted to mention something yeah. that Absolutely. jeff lockwood who i gave you a big shout out in my interview he's like oh you're, you're talking to tanya so um but he, he talked about asset management right and really that's what you're talking about do you know where all your open source assets are for when these zero day vulnerabilities are right when they when they get bad so that's great uh, i was just gonna highlight on that that shout that, out he gave you that thank you 
<laughs> Thank you, Jeff. That's actually the next thing that I was going to talk about. So there's sort of a new set of tools that are coming out and okay. I don't know what to call them yet, but there's a couple different companies doing this where they will like you give them the name of your company and like your main IPs and URLs that you're aware of. Mm -hmm. And then they will do like a public asset, um, like inventory and discovery. And Interesting. then, okay. yeah. And then there's a couple companies doing this and they all have a different name for it. And I think our industry has to come up with a real name for it. Like that we can yeah. all agree on. Right. So right. that I can, you know, like when I say static, um, static code analysis, everyone, people know what you're know, talking about. They know right? what I'm talking. Yeah, so right. right now I keep having to explain it, but the idea of having a full inventory of your public facing IPs and assets. Yep. Yep. Yes. I want that. And that does yeah. not need to happen in, in a pipeline, but then right. once you have that full list, which one of those are not in a pipeline because they better get into a pipeline. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and are you consolidating those right to where you can actually have visibility? Like you're talking about bringing them into that pipeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's great. Um, and then one other thing, Tanya, that I was going to ask um, uh, was just, you know, where, where do companies start? So I know you give a, a DevSecOps 101, right? So that mm -hmm. was everything outside the pipeline. What are some things that people can be focused on, you know, just when getting started? Is it cultural? I mean, there's these different areas, but where, where, where do you, what do you typically recommend in your 101 on where people should start? For DevSecOps? Yes. Yep. Definitely. Okay. So first of all, you as a security person want to go over and meet the DevOps team. Say, hi, <laughs> Right. <laughs> I am your person Relationship now. building, right. Yeah, Relationship building. Yep. Exactly. And then ask permission for what you want to do. So That's I would say, great. yeah. So the first two things that I generally advise putting in a pipeline is one scanning for secrets. So so you would want to scan the code repository already for secrets that are happening, but then you would want to set up something where every time code is pushed, it just tests the new code to see if okay. there are secrets in that. Because well, explain you, what a secret is, Tanya, just uh, oh, for yeah. those. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. No um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a secret is something like your API key or let's say credentials, a username mm -hmm. and password a connection string, which usually contains your password. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a certificate, a hash, a private key, right? So even if it's a public certificate, sometimes it's still called a secret, even though it's public. Um, but it. the idea is, is that you want to manage these usually in something called a secret store. So it is okay. a piece of software that's accessed programmatically. So human beings don't get to talk to the secret store usually just computers do. So you as a human will check in the API key for the first time, but then it's like, it's gone from you. You don't get to touch it. That means if Zach, if you and I were on the same team, mm -hmm. let, let's say you might need to re replace the API key because the API key has changed for some reason, but you can't just go in and look at it. And if for some reason you tried to, that would be logged and could be audited. Got it, got it. Thank and you. So the, the application will come in and talk to the, to the secret store. Or for instance, if you're building something, then your pipeline will actually talk to the secret store. And so you don't have to manage any of these secrets. It keeps them a secret for you Got it. and that's awesome. And so right. but having secrets in your code, I think a lot of people have heard about people accidentally checking in API keys or anything else into a GitHub public repo. And then everyone's like, no. <laughs> um, right. So if you can scan for that in your build pipeline, if you can find out immediately that that right. has happened, you could even trigger a security incident for starters, but also if you're really smooth, um, I saw a presentation by Microsoft at Microsoft build, like the team that works, that builds uh, their secret store. And they'd actually uh, created a little open source project of it'll automatically rotate your certificate for you if that happens. And I was just like, wow, damn guys, that's amazing. Like, good job. So rather than it issuing a security incident, it actually handles the incident and then tells you what happened. That's great. That's great. So definitely because a secret being published is basically the end of the world. <laughs> right. I would start with that. Then I would start with software composition analysis, just because mm -hmm. it's such a quick win and the results are generally extremely, extremely um, accurate compared to, for right. instance, something like um, static code analysis where the results, I just right. wouldn't put that uh, in the main pipeline personally. 
Yeah. Right. What percentage of the code would you say is open source, Tanya, in a typical application today? Oh, we open source or in libraries and third party components? Oh, libraries, like your dependencies, like how much of that is, is your actual code base? People say, in, so some people say it's as low as 60 and some people say it's as high as 90. I would say it's probably right. 80, 90% in most apps. Right. Like right. the actual code that you write, like every time you call a function, unless you wrote that function, <laughs> yep. right? right? Like <laughs> right. every single thing you do. And yep. usually if you're following my advice, if you're doing any sort of security functionality, you're calling the functionality in your framework and everything right. in your framework counts as third party. You didn't write your framework, I hope not. Right. <laughs> and, and, like unless you work at Microsoft or you work for like the actual place that makes the framework, I hope you're not writing your right. own frameworks. So, so yeah, I think people underestimate or, or forget just how much of their code is code that they didn't write and it all needs yeah. to be secure. Yeah. I, I do see a lot of organizations think that they don't have open source until they mm -hmm. find out they have a lot of open source. Right. So sometimes that could be eye opening, especially for the security team who thinks, Oh, we have a rule no open source, but the developers are using it rampantly, right? For all these frameworks and everything else. So that is, that's so great. True. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and even if it's proprietary, like the .NET framework is proprietary, right? Right. but you still didn't write it. Correct. Right. And, and so how are you managing that? Exactly. Right? And I have worked with that team and they're amazing human beings, but human beings still make mistakes. Yep. Right. And that's why we issue patches. <laughs> yep. And what, yeah. So what version are you on? Right. Yeah. Is that in version? Oh, exactly. Yeah. Version, exactly. version, so forth. So, well, this is great, Tanya. Very enlightening. I might have to sneak you back on here for a specific <laughs> topic on one of the, the things that I watch in your website. So I'm looking forward to that. So anybody um, that's watching, if you could maybe post some of those resources um, for people to be able to go check out or sign up for a class. Um, Tanya is one of the best. So I highly recommend it. And thank, thanks so much, Tanya, for, for joining me. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Zach.